Hello, everyone, and welcome to another amazing episode of Immigrant Masters Unite, when immigrants unite and transform lives. That's right. This podcast is all about helping you transform your life, your business, and the world around you. And I'm your host, as always, Polish Peter, right? Now, you may or may not be an immigrant entrepreneur or a business owner. That's perfectly fine. However, on this particular podcast, what I get to do, and I keep saying this every single week, but I do get to do this. I get to talk dissect, strategize, and get into the minds of master immigrants who came into this country, sometimes starting from nothing, and create a successful, abundant, and impactful life for themselves while actually transforming the world around them. I'm, today, I have such a guest, and her name is Mercedes Conception Gray. She's originally from Dominican Republic, which is one of those places that's on my bucket list, but uh, I haven't been there yet, which I'm hoping that I'm going to get to there within the next year or so. Mercedes is a transformational executive leader who is consistently blending strategy and smart execution to drive commercial impact. Now, what does that mean is that she is an amazing person when it comes to bringing in talent into your company. We're going to probably talk about hiring and hire, how to hire the right people, the perfect people for your company. Because if you have a business where you need company, when you, have, when you need employees, this is one of the most important aspects that you probably need to have figured out. So that's what we're going to talk about. She's a transparent leader. She's a great communicator who inspires trust in clients. And currently, she is a founder and CEO of Gray Matter LLC and a president of Coalescence Incorporated, which is doing business as Patrice and Associates. And that is the company that specializes in hiring great talent for the healthcare industry, which I think we can all really uh, get advantage of when it comes to this on this particular phone call. Now, she's a passionate about her family. She loves to travel. She spends time on the lake and the beach, and she loves to have fun. And here's an interesting, cool little fact. For several years now, her the family has sponsored an orphanage in the Dominican Republic that's home to approximately 45 kids. So in a way, kind of Mercedes, you have like 45 kids that are in your family, right? <laughs> so how are you? Thank you for uh, being on the call. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Very cool. So tell me a little bit about your story of ended up here in the United States, actually. Yeah, well, you know, we all have different journeys of how we arrive here to this great country. So my initial arrival to the country was actually when I was eight years old. Uh, my family moved to New York City. Um, and I'll always remember uh, being in awe as an eight-year-old child, seeing all the lights coming from a country that um, didn't have that many lights. But um and we were there for four years, so that, that was my first entry um, to the country um, at that age. We then moved back to Dominican Republic where I finished high school and finished college, um, uh, got my engineering degree, and decided at that point in time that I wanted to really explore my opportunities. So I decided to come back to the U.S., and at that point, as I tell my story, I had the blessing of my parents, um, two suitcases and $200, uh, an education and a family that opened their doors to help me get started. All right, very good. See, one of those things that I hear a lot from people who have uh, experience with that or people who are like interested about, you know, immigrants and they hear stories about, you know, you come here with a suitcase in your hand and you have $200 in your pocket actually interviewed a gentleman who came from Cuba and he had 20 bucks in his pocket, you know, he lands in the country and it's like, how you survive that? You know I mean? There are people who have no idea how to survive it on a paycheck and you come in here at $200. So that act alone probably takes something and it creates a way for you to actually be a lot more uh, when it comes to business world, right? Like as far as an entrepreneur, right? It helps you, that experience probably helps you in entrepreneurial endeavors, doesn't it? Well, I, I, th I think it does in the sense that, you know, it, it, it kind of creates the mindset of, I have nothing to lose, therefore I can take risks. 
And I'm willing to take risks because I can always go back to nothing and I'm not afraid of it. Right. That, so is that, well, that was well put. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that that's the mindset that it creates. You know, I, I it's just if, if everything goes wrong, I'm okay with it. Um, right. so before you kind of overcome that fear of figuring it out, you know, and as, as we, as we obtain more, we get more fearful of things. So I think that that's really what that did, right? It was more of, I took off. Um, I always say, you know, it's not like I was on the streets with 200 bucks. I was, I had a family that housed me, gave me food, right. and gave me a place to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest platform for me, which I'm a big advocate of, is, is an education. Right. And that's where you kind of like fell into it, right? As far as what you were end up doing and... Right. And you ended up with this company right now, right? So right. tell me a little bit about the company, what you guys do specifically. Well, we're focused on really acquiring talent for the, the hospitality, food and beverage industry, which is a big industry, right? So mm -hmm. we exist in corporations. Um, it, it's, food is everywhere, as I tell everybody, food manufacturing. And really our focus is in, in the management talent in that industry for business services. So really working with, small to large businesses and really in the acquisition of the talent that they need to help their business succeed. All right. Gotcha. Does that include like restaurants and stuff? Yeah, it's restaurants, hotels, it's food manufacturing. Um, we also focus a lot in business services. So spas and, you know, I, I say uh, businesses that provide services to a consumer. All right. Um, we have uh, clients that are produce fast signs and, um, we have food manufacturing and we also have do um, food distributors. So anywhere where there is food and we really focused on the talent for the unit level and all the way up to the corporations, the C-levels of those businesses. All right. Gotcha. So from what I understand, the service industry, like restaurant business and that kind of an industry has a lot of turnover, right? When it comes to employment, is that right? It's a very high turnover, yes. Yeah, high um, turnover. It's a high turnover. You know, it's, it's an industry that I think people that are in it are in it because they're very passionate about it because it's a lot of hard work. Right. Uh, so it's a high turnover industry. Um, you know, the average tenure of a manager in a restaurant unit is probably two to three years max. Wow. Okay, yeah. so... Hiring the right person is probably one of the biggest problems that these kinds of companies face. So yeah. how do I go about... So listen, for those of you guys listening, whether you are in the you know, food industry or not, or you are in any kind of business, but you're looking for employees, I think this is a really important for call for you to listen to because if you figure out how to hire for long term someone who is in a high turnover industry and they stay in there that I think you can figure out how to hire for other industries. Right. So <laughs> tell me a little bit like how does the, the typical hiring process from what I understand is you post an ad somewhere, people apply for it. Uh, you go through the resumes, you go and pick some of the top resumes that you've seen, like they, you think they're going to be a great hire because of the experience they've had or the degree or whatever it might be. Then you schedule some uh, interviews and you interview a few people and then you end up hiring. That's my view of a typical hiring process that typically happens, which doesn't necessarily work very well. So... Tell me about the right way of hiring. How, what's the difference there? Well, that, that is what was the traditional process. But in reality, we're in a very tight job market. You know, the um, unemployment rate being very low. So really the talent out there, 70 to 80% of the talent, the top talent is not applying to your job ad. So the job ads are really a very passive way of trying to attract talent. So in today's environment, it's really about networking for your talent. It's about leveraging social media. It's about attracting people to you and selling yourself as to why should I work for you and what this does. So, so job ads are really 
I would say one out of a hundred people that applies to a job that might be a good candidate. If you really want the top talent, part of what we do is we're after that passive talent. And that passive talent is the people that are really have the skills, are great, but they're not necessarily actively looking for a job. They want to be attracted. They want to be inspired. They want to be connected to. So having a strategy where you're networking for your talent where you're really out there and leveraging social media to attract your talent is something that every business should be adding to their way of attracting talent. Okay, gotcha. So what I'm hearing from that is the the regular way of doing it is you post ads, you basically put stuff out there to hopefully somebody sees the ad and comes to you. That's right. What you're telling us is the right way of doing it. Most of these people who are going to be a great talent for your business are not those types of people who are applying that way, like on Monster or whatever the case may be. You have to go and start networking for these people and having conversations. And literally, you have to sell yourself in a way to them to bring that talent within your company. So it kind of like has to work with your culture. Am I hearing that right? That, that is correct. And create, a, you know, as an employer, create your sales pitch, Right create your sales pitch of why and also understand the culture that you want to build in your business because it you know there's a saying and I'm sure I took this from somebody else but I believe in it so much is you you hire for attitude and then you train for because really there's two aspects of the people you're looking for and the people that are going to stay with you are the people that are going to be aligned with you with your culture the people that believe in your vision the people that can get passionate about it. Um, Yes, you want the skills behind it, right? But you can Mm. also train up for skills. You cannot train up for attitude. Right. So if you were to put a uh, kind of like, let's say percentages, like how important is the attitude in hiring versus the skills? Oh, um, you know, I'm going to answer that question. It depends on what level in the organization. You know, definitely if you have your doers and your hourly workers, I mean, they're going to be more skills. The more mm-hmm. you go up as far as supervisors and managers and the more above, that percentage mm-hmm. shifts, right? Right. Because you've already made it to this level. So at that level, if you come in as a leader or as a general manager of a unit or, or whatever it is, hotel, restaurant, or even a business, it shifts because you're looking more for the culture to be higher because that person has already had the experience to get them to that level from that perspective. All right. So let's talk about the actual hiring process of, you know, you get the resume, let's say for somebody because you've kind of network and eventually I guess they send you the resume, right? So you can kind of look at it. So you do kind of see the skills. If they have some kind of skills on there, do you look, beyond the skills like how you i guess you know look at that resume how you start the process how you hire what well, are you looking for yeah so so every business should be you know part of what we do as an agency when we meet with our clients is we understand you know what what is the type of people that succeed in your organization and different business owners are different, right? Some business owners, you know, just want people that are very numbers focused, right? They want factual people that see things in black and white. And that's what they want. Some other businesses want people that uh, are going to be more people oriented, that are going to be leaders and train others and train them up. Mm-hmm. The first thing as a business that you need to understand is what's, what's that culture? Once you see that resume, obviously, uh, what I recommend is you create two sets of questions one set of questions just to validate that this person has the skills that you need to bring to your business. But another set of questions that really focuses on, on finding out, is this the right, um, is the right attitude? Is this the right kind of soft skills? Um, as an example for my own business, I bring people, I say, you know, my key things is I want people that are abundance versus scarcity, people that are going to be how to solve the problem or people that are going to be creative So in the questions that I create, I create questions to understand that. In addition to that, what businesses can do in that process, so I kind of go through steps. The first steps is let's make sure that the skills are there, verify Mm -hmm. that the resume is accurate, that, you know, things jive with each other. Right. 
second step is more of the cultural fit questions, right? Is the attitude that I want to bring to my organization there? Are the right um, soft skills there? The third part of that process, um, there's lots of assessments today. Um, you know, I leverage a lot what I call the DISC assessment because it helps me understand are the people going to fit in. So there's all types of different assessments that you could, you know, sometimes investing $20 in something like that can go a long way mm-hmm. for you to give you some further insights. Now, depending on the type of business, um, and the level that you're bringing in, you should create some sort of team type approach of interview with the people that these employees are going to interact with, or what I call a kind of on the job evaluation, because that gives you more of a very small taste of how that person is going to behave in the behaviors, which really are completely different from the skills. So that's kind of a little bit of a high level way. and. I say hire slow and fire fast. And what that means is invest the right time in the front end, because when you invest the right time in the front end to get the right people in, then you're going to get the longer retention. Then you're going to get the longer success. And then you're going to get people that are really going to help you grow your business. Right. Exactly. I heard that many times and I totally agree with that about hiring slow and firing fast. And typically what ends up happening in companies, it's the other way around because you hire somebody. Actually, one of my clients right now, he's dealing with that particular situation where he hired somebody and he feels it like this person is not a good fit. He's not performing like he's supposed to. And he's just not wanting to take the step to like let go of this person because he's just like afraid and he doesn't want to be the bad guy and, and all that kind of stuff, right? And it's something that, and it's dragging him, it's dragging his energy and, and now he's getting effective. And guess what? You're the owner, the employees, the management, whoever it is underneath you that are, in, that are interacting with you, they're getting affected. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it has a big, you know, uh, impact on the company when that happens. What I want to ask you, because I think you mentioned a couple of things on your little uh, description now here which I don't think a lot of people are aware of is one, which I use actually when it comes to my own clients and my students, I use the disc profile quite often, the assessment. And, but I don't think many people are aware of it. So elaborate a little bit about the disc profile. Like why is it useful and how would you use it? Well, the, the way I use it in, in my business, right, we find that certain profiles are going to, be more successful doing the type of work that we do, which is recruiting, right? Recruiting Mm -hmm. is is a very tough job because you're, you're having to, in a sense, be a salesperson, a psychologist, a detective, and a whole bunch. And you also need to have the drive. So the disc profile is a very simple tool because it really, it describes a person into either a D, whether they're driven and the I, the I, which is really people focused, the S, which is more of the, emotional side, and then the C, which is more organization and control. Mm -hmm. So the way I use it, we found in our business that the profiles that are above the line in the D and an I, for sure, I need people that are high in the I um, to be able to do the type of work that we do. Right. So depending on the business that you're in, you can determine what, what profile works best. But I think beyond that, what I find is, I have great people that don't necessarily all fit the mold, but what I use it for is as new people come in, it helps the people in my business know how to communicate with each other. And it helps me as the leader know how to communicate with them, which is really a great way that I use that tool because we're able to, in the front end, look at the report and say, hey, you know, you're the type of person that needs to really be convinced that something is true. So how I communicate with that person as a manager versus the person that I just want to do and go. So I think it becomes a great leadership business leader tool to help maximize the strengths of your team. Right. This is really good guys, because here's the thing when it comes to hiring process, right? There's the resume, the skills and all that, but tool like the disc assessment tool is really powerful because if you are hiring for a certain 
position. And let's say that person is like in Mercedes case, you know, she needs to be recruiting. She needs to be a high eye. So to just elaborate a little bit on what she said, you know, DISC, the D stands for one, you know, each letter stands for a type of a person that you hire. And when you know what kind of a position you're hiring for, what kind of a person you want in that position, skills is one thing. But how they make decisions is another thing. How they interact with other people, how they are they're detailed or they're a big picture person, how they're somebody who makes swift decisions or they have to have all the facts before they make the decision. Are they decision maker or they're not? It's going to depend on the type of a position that you're hiring for. And the DISC profile will help you align that person to that position. So that's the first great part about it. The second great part about it, once you hire that person, you will have a tool for yourself as the company owner, as the manager. So even if you are hiring for lower management or for even like, a, do you do those tests for uh, even like entry level kind of employees, like for in service industry, do they take the disk test? Um, you can do it. i you know, I basically use it more for my own business and my own okay. people because each one of my clients have different things that they may do. And I really highly recommend when I have clients that don't do anything for them to do it. Right. Because I think one of the great things about it is because this is what I do with my own clients, for instance, my coaching clients. So they all have to do the disk test. And once I have the disk test, I see if they're a high person or a high D or a high C person, I can determine how do I reach that person? How do I talk to them? How do I interact with them, right? Do they need a lot of facts in order for them to take that next step, right? Or are there a person who's going to make a quick decision or are there a more emotional person? And it all helps you to speak quote unquote, their language to be able to motivate them to get them to do things and to, you know, bring them into your company. And I think that's a big missing piece for a lot of companies because they don't look at it that way. And a lot of business owners or managers have this one style of managing and they feel like everybody has to align with that. But I think a lot of it, when you're in the upper management position or your business owner, you kind of have to have different ways of managing your employees, depending on what kind of a person that is, especially with the higher level employees, correct? Oh, absolutely. And the way I see it is, you know, as, as a small business owner or any business owner, our biggest investment is in people. So for me is the more I know about how they receive information, how I can help them be their best, it's, it's a win-win because they win, I win, everybody wins. And it is very important to really, as a leader, be in that place where you, you're the one that has to adapt to how they receive information and how you motivate them. And that's how I use that tool as well. Exactly. Awesome. Very cool. Now, let me ask you this. Do you deal anything post the hiring process? Do you have any ideas like now you have these employees because... Here's the thing. I see quite often that whether it's a manager or an employee um, that's been around for a while within the company, sometimes they start grumbling about this boss or, you know, that I hate this company and all that kind of stuff. And what I find a lot is it comes from their uh, view of what this company is about, right? Or it comes from a lot of it comes from the miscommunication between the boss and employee, right? The disc profile, yeah. right? Yeah. Do you find like, is there a way to save this employee or keep him on board or restructure this? Or what would you give them an advice on that? Yeah, I should share with you a little bit of a research that I did paper and, and I share this with my clients as well is one thing is attracting the talent, but then it's really what do you have to do in those first 90 days as an employer to make sure that you now maximize that acquisition? And, you know, acquiring good talent takes a lot of time and effort. Mm -hmm. So it's a big investment as a business owner. 
So a big part of it is to have a good onboarding process. And that onboarding process is really to, to help employees understand, you know, how to operate in your organization, um, kind of the rules or the guardrails around how they can succeed. But it's also about establishing good communication. One thing that we do in our business is we actually, with our clients, we guarantee that when employees come in, right, we guarantee them for a period of time. So what we do is we check in with those new employees every two weeks and we, we, we coach both the employee and the employer to help them through that period. A big part of it is that communication, right? The employee comes in, everybody's enthusiastic, mm-hmm. but then all of a sudden the manager doesn't really understand how that employee, employee receives information. And what we find most of the time, they're just miscommunicating. They both want the same thing. Right. <laughs> We're not finding that common ground of communication. It happens. Um, we've talked people off the ledge. Um, I have a story of a candidate we placed, and within six weeks, he was talking to his um, staffing partner and saying, I would just want to leave here. And my recruiter did a fantastic job in helping him through. Now he's t- two and a half years later, and he's there and he's very happy. And it was all that initial miscommunication. And The way I tell my clients is treasure that very important investment that you have with you and take the time to understand how to communicate with them. And no longer are we in an environment which as an employer, we assume that you should be lucky that I gave you a job, right? It's not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. Right. And it's a shift in your mindset as an employer. Yes. You have to because it's no longer about, hey, be thankful that you have a job and just do whatever I tell you to do. Mm -hmm. You have to be more collaborative. You have to understand and especially with the new workforce and the millennials and as we shift, what motivates them is no longer just having a job or money. So a very simple question sometimes that I tell my clients is, in the front end, and this is what we do in our interview process, we ask our candidates, what is it that will motivate you? What are you looking for to satisfy your career? Because we need to start talking about careers, not just jobs. And especially with this millennial, a lot of time is work-life balance. A lot of time is just more freedom. So if you understand what makes them happy and it doesn't cost you most of the time anything, why not is my philosophy with that. Right. That's a really good point because even just the one simple question, right? What motivates you? Because a lot of times employers, I think, think like, well, what motivates them is money. That's not always the case, right? And if you were to think that like it's the money, then you're totally missing the boat as far as how to communicate with a person, right? And how to keep them happy and keep them in your company. Because listen, happy employees in a lot of companies will do amazing things for your company, for your growth, for your reputation in the marketplace, for all kinds of things. Um, Tell me a little bit, do you have any kind of tips or strategies to share about the onboarding process? You said 90-day onboarding process. Did you research that? Is it 90 days or is it depending on industry or... Well, it depends. I always have in my mind is, you know, it it, it takes 90 days just to get anything to gel, right? Mm -hmm. And actually, that mindset comes also from, you know, 90 days to six months, really, to to mend things. Um, It's not so much that you have to wait 90 days for an employee to be productive, but even on my other side, which is my, you know, you mentioned gray matter, focused a lot on process and optimization of companies. Mm-hmm. Even when I introduce new process changes, it's like it takes a period of time to get that feedback and to really get into the groove of systematically doing something. So I think, you no, know, I mean, the, the first part of onboarding is really determining, um, regardless of who you hire, you have to have some sort of first week type of training to help them understand how to maneuver within your business and organization. So I think it's more of a, of a, you know, the the first one or two weeks, there has to be some uh, training and whether it's methodology, whether whatever tools that you use in your company, whatever that is to help that person have what they need. 
Um, I think the other big part of the onboarding process is giving that person kind of a tenured um, buddy or mentor inside your organization, even if that's you yourself as a business owner. Um, as an example, what I do in the first 90 days, I meet every week with any new employee to really make sure that you help them through, you know, when you're a new employee, and let's assume that you have experience and you were successful doing something else, but when you start something completely new, you don't know yet how to be successful in that environment. So I think opening those channels of communication and also uh, giving that new employee the, the open door of making sure that they know that, hey, we're going to be there with you, we're going to mentor you, um, we're going to make sure, by the way, making sure that they understand what you expect from them, very directive and clear at the beginning, mm -hmm. because you're still getting to know each other. So that's what I'm calling the onboarding, right, is, is really creating that safety period where you're able to make sure that the two of you as employee and employer come together and are being the most productive together. Exactly. I like that because a couple of things that I heard you say is um, training is really important at the beginning. So, um, you know, sometimes a lot of us, because they're so busy with the business, we kind of expect them to just come in and just jump in and just do whatever it is needs to be done. Whereas, you know, that's not really because then their end, they're going to feel frustrated sometimes and that's not going to help on their end to feel like they belong in this company. So that's one thing. Second thing I heard was having the processes in place to help them is really important systems in place. Third thing is communications, two-way communication with, I, I, I do this with my employees that, listen, if you screw something up, I want you to come to me and have a conversation. I'm not going to, there's not going to be judgment on I am. This is what I can promise you and have that courage to come to me and have the conversation to talk about it and figure out what we need to do. Yeah. Because I think when they have that space to be able to talk and say what's bothering them or whatever, I think it helps the company grow. Right. Absolutely agree with that. Um, you know, I, I have um, in my company, I have what I call the little book of big rules. And one of the little, you know, the rules in that book is about really the problems don't get better with time. So if you don't create that open channel of communication, I as an employee may be trying to solve something that, you know, and I always say reach out for help. And if you really create that safety environment at the beginning, mm -hmm. then your employees begin to really feel good about bringing ideas to you. I always say, you know, look at the problem and bring the solutions to the problem. So I think that that's really the, the powerful impact of doing that at the beginning. All right. Very cool. Awesome. So listen, Mercedes, I think you shared some great information here. I want to respect your time and the listeners' time here. So I want to go into my Polish Pillars final round. And my first question in that is, what book would you recommend our listeners to read? Well, one of the books that I think helped me in my journey from being an employee to an entrepreneur is a book called The Power of Now. Um, and The Power of Now was really, a, for me, a very powerful book because I was in a place where I wasn't very happy. And, you know, I was making great money. Talk about, you know, money is not happiness and everything. I was making right. great money. I was traveling all over the world. I had some amazing experience, which I'm very grateful for because they helped me position for today. Mm -hmm. But there was this, this, this something inside me that wasn't satisfied. And that book really helped me to take the leap to a place where I'm, you know, I'm just having fun. All right. Awesome. That is a great book. I've read that book actually, and it's a really good book. Um, next question that I have for you is, uh, you know, we give some really good advice up to this point, And I think listeners have gotten some good things out of it. If you could tie it into one little bow tie, as far as when it comes to hiring the right person, that's going to last for your company, what would you say it would be? It, I would say it would be invest the time to be able to really assess what the right talent for you really means. 
and make sure that you are very methodical and intentful in, in, in going through that acquisition process. Exactly. Yeah. Take the time to hire right, right? Like you said at one point, it's like, take the, uh, what was the quote? Um, hire slow, fire fast, something fast, like that. Yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah, it's so important to hire slow, guys, uh, because you're going to save a lot of time and energy and heartache by going that way. All right. Next question is, uh, what is one thing you would want the listeners to know about your own country, Dominican Republic, whether it's a custom, people, saying, whatever it might be, or a place? Uh, well, we, we Dominicans like to say that um, Dominican Republic is the lost Eden of paradise. <laughs> okay. It, it gives, it gives, it has the, it, it, even though it's an island, um, it offers such a diversity of landscape and fauna, anywhere from deserts. Um, and we have only, I think, one of two naturally salt water lakes in the world. Really? Yes. Okay. There's crocodiles and everything. <laughs> wow. Have you been in that lake? Yes, I have. You can't really sink, can you? No, no, oh. no, you can't. It's uh, iguanas, crocodiles, and cactuses, which you wouldn't expect to see in an island most of wow. the time. Wow. That's yeah. very cool. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Next question that I have. I believe that every single person in the world has a superpower. What's yours? Um. I, th I think it's determination, optimism, and not giving up. Right. I think that's a common denominator among a lot of uh, people who are successful in business and a lot of immigrants. You know, determination, never give up, and and having that drive to just keep going. You know, just keep going. Next time, next, next. Right. Just do it. And I think it's a it's a one of those things that. When people put that into their lives, wow, amazing things can happen. All right. Last question that I have for you is if somebody were to you know, find out more about you or reach out to you so you can help them maybe hire somebody in their company, how would they do that? Well, they, they have various ways. Um, a great way is if you're on LinkedIn, you can look me up on LinkedIn, uh, Mercedes Concepcion Gray. Also, our website, patriceandassociates.com. And go to the regional office in Marietta in that site um, under zip code 30062. Um, and that is patriceandassociates.com in Georgia. All right. Awesome. Very cool. So, Mercedes, thank you so much for sharing this uh, great content with us here, for sharing some of your story of how you got here to the United States. I think a lot of listeners probably gotten something good out of this conversation because when it comes to hiring people, it is one of the most important things that you can do for your business. And have you shared some really golden nuggets? And I think it was even some mind shifts that uh, some people might have gotten, you know. So thank you so much for uh, being on here. For you listeners, like I say always, I appreciate you guys. Thank you for being, for listening to this podcast because Without you listening and without you being on here, I wouldn't be able to do this. And you are actually helping me live my vision for life of what I want to do and help to support the immigrant community. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, if you have any guests that you want to recommend or you would want to be a guest on this particular podcast, head over to mastersunite.com. That's mastersunite.com and reach out to me there. Or you can find me on LinkedIn or Facebook as well. You know, just type in Polish Peter or, or Peter Kolad, you end up finding me on there. So again, thank you so much, Mercedes. I look forward to creating a, a bigger relationship with you in some shape or form. And uh, for you guys, until next time, this is Polish Peter out. Thank you. Bye.